Welcome everyone, my name is JV Robles and I'll be your moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us here at Netcom Learning. As a market leader in providing managed learning services, we are very excited to host today's business productivity webinar on email is still the killer app and how to optimize it. Presenting today's topic is Vincent Supa. Vincent teaches graduate business courses at New York University, is an efficiency hacker and a certified executive Six Sigma black belt. He specializes in working with pre-IPO startups, helping them to position themselves for public offering, acquisition, or merger. Vincent worked in Asia as an expat, as well as in the US high tech industry and European telecommunications sector. Self-described as a part of Generation Flux, he is the founding president of HR Avant-Garde. Please bear in mind that this is an overview of a very robust topic, and we do offer a collection of both technical and business courses that can be tailored towards your specific requirements. If you are interested in speaking further with a learning consultant, you can absolutely make an appointment with us on our website, netcomlearning.com. Now, before we get started, I will just give you a quick overview of the logistics. To start with, you have the option to adjust the window size to your liking. You can simply hit the escape key and find the zoom button on the top left corner of your GoToWebinar viewer, which is right up here. Everyone has been muted as well, except for our presenters today. You can feel free to submit any questions you have for the presenter here in the questions pane. And a copy of a PDF uh, file would be under the handout section. Now I'll just give you a moment here to show you where you can access this recording. If you could go, you could go on to our website, netcomlearning.com. On the right-hand side, you'd be able to see the free webinars tab. You could click on that. So up here, you will see all of the upcoming live webinars and events coming up within uh, this month and next month. You could sign up for as many as you want. And down here would be all of the recently completed webinars. Feel free to review them as well. Now, without further ado, I will give it over to Vincent to present today's topic. Thank you, JV. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be with you. The least you need to know about how to optimize email in 18 minutes. Let's get started. Now, people may not realize that email is an app. It's probably the most famous app, and it still remains as the killer app. And email is an extension of your professional branding. Done right, it will help your branding. Done wrong, it will harm your professional branding. Now, email can either be leveraged or it can be used in a suboptimal way. I would like you to consider that there are three taxes that we all pay. Of course, there's tax on our money. That's the most obvious. But what people do not always realize, there's also a tax on our time and a tax on our broadband. Broadband refers to how complex a task is. So if I could do my laundry while I'm on a conference call, that means doing laundry, it might take a lot of time, but it has a low tax on my broadband. And email done right will limit the tax on other people's time and on other people's broadband, and you have a higher likelihood of getting a quicker, more accurate response while improving your own professional branding. Number one. Time, not money, is the scarcest resource of all. You can always make more money, but we can never make more time. So in email, respect the recipient's time. Minimize the amount of time that the reader will have to spend trying to understand what you're asking. This requires you to spend more time writing concise emails until it eventually becomes automatic. Once you write your email in draft format, before sending, I would like you to edit out every possible sentence that does not mitigate content and then edit out every possible word that, again, does not diminish content. And then you'll be sending out a much leaner, more efficient email. Again, you're minimizing the tax on time and broadband of the person having to read your email. Number two, being curt is not impolite. If something is urgent, why would you use an overloaded communication channel like email to begin with? 
pick up the phone and we'll talk more about that later. If you're like me, I could easily spend 40 to 50 hours a week doing nothing more than methodically replying to all my email. So if a reply takes a long time coming, don't take it personally because we're all drowning in email. Simply pick up the phone. Number three, now I realized that I had been tweeting way before Twitter. When I was younger, I developed the habit of putting the entire email in the subject line, ending it by the acronym EOM, end of message. So my recipient would not even have to open up the email because the information I wanted to convey was in the subject line, followed by end of message. Now, don't use the same subject line on each email because it is harder for the recipient to look up that email days or weeks or even months later. Many people never change the subject line, so they're using an antiquated subject line that makes looking up that email that much more difficult. In your subject line, consider using status categories, action item, time sensitive, alerting the person that that email has somewhat of a high priority, or even considering their time, put low priority, if it is a low priority email, in the subject line. And then we're going to talk more about this later, but I want you to be concise. There's a movement stating that email should never be more than five sentences, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Number four, no open-ended queries. An example that I use, if you were to send me an email asking me why did the Roman Empire fall, you spent five to seven seconds writing me an email that now invites me to spend 30 to 40 minutes to reply. So if you have an open-ended question, it might take you a minute to compose that email, but think of the burden you're placing on the recipient. So if you have an open-ended question that's nuanced, complex, again, pick up the phone. Email is perfect for binary questions. Will you be attending the meeting? Yes, no. Or spend a little bit more time offering multiple choices in your email that put the burden on you and not the recipient. And again, end open-ended questions because that's like playing digital, digital tag. Number five. Let's get rid of excess CCs. There's a surplus of CCs that flood all of our inboxes, and adding other people to the CC list should never be done casually. Now, if you receive a multiple recipient email, why hit reply or automatically? Scale back, consider who you feel really needs to read the email, because when you just hit reply all without really thinking about who needs this information, you're being inconsiderate to other people's inboxes. And again, that eventually hurts our professional branding. We never want to be known as the person that sends out excessive emails. Now, when we send out emails for FYI, be prudent with that because we are already drowning in excess information. The more emails we receive, the more difficult it is to decipher which emails are truly important. Number six. Let's use a tie to thread. Now, some emails need a thread, meaning the previous emails for context, but it is rare for threads to extend to multiple emails, two, three, four, and five. So what I do, if I see a very long thread, I determine the last couple of threads might not be necessary. I'll just delete them because it is very important to me to avoid digital clutter. It makes what I write stand out even more. Number seven. Let's limit attachments. It's very clumsy to use graphic files as logos of our companies or graphic files that are merely our signatures because often we have to now download these files only to determine that it was simply the logo of the company and that puts a tax on our time. We don't want to waste time trying to open up attachments just to see was there anything important. And do not send text as an attachment when it could easily be included in the body of the email. And to reiterate, it's that much better to even put it in the body of the subject line ended with the letters EOM, end of message. Now, you're not being impolite. People will really appreciate that you're considering their time. Number eight, the greatest gift you can give someone is NNTR, no need to reply. You've given the information and the person no longer has to spend time replying. 
Again, I'm a big, big advocate of using EOM, end of message. That was rule number three. Try to put the entire email, perhaps nine words or less, in the subject line. Number nine, let's consider limiting our responses. We do not need to reply to every email that may not require a definitive response. Have you ever gotten an email that says, thank you for your note, and then the other person says, well, thank you for your thank you. It never ends. Break the cycle again. It is not being rude. Work on developing your professional relationships through information interviews, phone calls, but superfluous back and forth emails. Again, it puts a tax on other people's bandwidth and time and it slightly erodes our professional branding. We want to use email this way, that when someone receives an email from us, we use it so efficiently, so sparingly, that person knows it must be important and will address it that much more quickly. Number 10, unplug. Schedule time when you're not on email. A common error I believe that people do is that they wake up in the morning they get to the office and the first thing they do is they check their email. Now I understand you may need to check if your boss had sent something that was urgent or if you work in multiple time zones. So you want to use this advice, uh, consider it in a balanced perspective. But when you check email first thing in the morning, you are now letting other people, not yourself, set your own agenda. So I recommend when you go to the office in the morning, you immediately work on the tasks that you had scheduled the night before that you needed to complete. And then when your mind needs a mental break, then you go on email. This way you're setting your agenda, you're not checking email first thing in the morning and responding to people, letting them set your priorities. And I'm a big fan of email free weekends. Sometimes you want to put an order response and you could simply state the virtue of spending real time with your family. Again, this is managing your own professional and personal brand, letting people know what is important to you. And I don't believe it's productive to be on email seven days a week constantly checking the iPhone because it minimizes the time, the face-to-face -face time, that we need to spend with the people who are with us at that moment. Now here are some email mistakes to avoid. Now this webinar is filled with common sense, but sometimes it's good simply to be reminded to make sure that we are avoiding these mistakes. Now there are many examples, many of us have sent out an email when we're in the middle of composing it. It happens. Well, a very simple tip enter the recipient address after you have already composed the entire email. This reduces the risk of accidentally sending it out before you have completed the email. We have also received and been guilty of sending an email where we had forgotten to attach the attachment. We might say please refer to the attachment but we forgot to actually attach the file. So another tip is when you're composing a new email upload the attachment first then write the text of the email, and then thirdly, add the recipient's address. This will avoid making the mistake of sending out an email prematurely and then having to send a second email apologizing. Now, when we go away for vacation, we come back, we might have two, three hundred emails, and often we begin replying methodically one by one. Don't do that. Look at your entire inbox before replying to any email because what often happens is we will reply to an email and then as we go through the inbox we realize that someone else had already resolved the issue. So if you're away from email for a couple of days, for a couple of weeks, review the entire inbox, take some notes and then begin replying to avoid redundancy. Also, avoid including your email signature again and again and again. I'm a big fan in avoiding digital clutter. It's a very zen approach to email. The more white space on the email, the more prominent will be the content that you did include in that email. It's also very considered to include a phone number as a footer, but you don't want a lot of digital clutter at the end of your email. Now, be mindful about composing emails too quickly because what people don't realize is that email is the perfect storm. It has the informality of a conversation combined with the permanence of a legal document. So avoid composing emails 
too quickly on the fly. And be mindful about violating the company's email policy. Many firms have aggressive spam filters to monitor blue language and even words such as job search. So we don't want to necessarily trip the system. Now, let's not forget to include basic greetings. Now, I said to avoid digital clutter, so now what do I want to add the greeting, Dear John or Dear Jane? Well, first of all, these simple pleasantries give emotional context to the email. And when someone sees the name in writing, it's a very powerful thing. You are adjusting their mindful approach to receiving the information. And common sense, when you have a multiple recipient email, the Dear John or Dear Jane directs who the the email is being directly sent to. Now, emailing when angry, of course, is catastrophic. A common rule of thumb is if you need to vent, if you receive an email that upsets you and you feel you need to vent and reply quickly, save it in your draft folder and review it the next day. Often what we will do is pull back on the email a little bit after we've sat with it for a day. So again, common sense, ladies and gentlemen, avoid writing emails when you're angry. Now again, I'm going to reiterate, do not underestimate the importance of subject lines because they are used when people need to search for the email. So don't continually use the same subject line in the thread, but make the subject line with the highest degree of specificity as you can. That means frequently changing the subject line as you're going back and forth. Do not have general subject lines. And again, if feasible, I will never get tired of saying this, start putting the entire email in the subject line, end it by end of message to get the quickest reply. This is going to build your own professional brand as the person that respects everyone else's time and uses email very efficiently. Now, blind copies. Use it sparingly because, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, BCCs are rarely a secret. There have been examples of people receiving an email. They were BCC'd on it. They did not realize they were BCC'd on it, so then they hit reply all, and they blew your cover, and now everyone knows that you use BCC. You burn someone once, and then you lose your reputation. So if you feel you must put someone on a blind copy, use it sparingly and it's probably much more efficient to forward an email to someone rather than putting them on the blind copy. And hit and reply all unintentionally, that could be embarrassing and ruin credibility. So do not hit reply all without thinking. Really go through the distribution list and figure out who do you really want on that reply. Now I want to talk about phone calls. Now phone calls is real-time immediate info exchange. If you're trying to work out a problem with an email, it could take one or two days because you're going back and forth, back and forth in emails. When you can pick up the phone and in five to seven minutes have a real-time conversation and resolve the issue on the spot. I find that people are not using phone calls as much as they used to and while email is efficient, sometimes you wind up spending more time going back and forth with an email rather than resolving it on the spot with the phone call. And remember, a phone call is a very high rich medium. It provides emotional context and it also is very effective in building a relationship, much more effective than simply emailing someone. And when you make a phone call, you can adjust your message based on the real-time feedback of the person that you called. Whereas once you send out an email, it's in the ether and now you really can't make any adjustments because you already hit the send button. So again, phone calls give us a quicker time to market. It provides emotional context and it also helps us solidify those relationships that really help us succeed at business. Now here's our email manifesto. There's a movement called five sentences or less. It's a movement uh, by people who are trying to end the massive overuse of email and by overuse we mean when email is no longer efficient and it's actually hampering productivity. So your email should be limited to five sentences or less. What are those sentences? What should they say? Who are you? What do you want? Why are you asking me? And then what's in it for me? Why should I do what you're asking? And then what are the next steps? You want to edit out all the excess in the email to make a reply easier. Again, after you write the email, take out any sentence that does not diminish the content and then take out every word that does not further diminish the content. 
the only thing that's okay not to limit is praise. If you are wording something in affirmation, complimenting someone, then by all means, feel free to go on a little bit more. It's okay not to limit praise. Now, our non sequitur of the day, a proverb. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. The reason why all of you have joined me on today's webinar is because, like me, you want to improve the quality of your professional life, and that's always a good thing. So if there's a piece of operational advice that you picked up today, don't worry about that you haven't been doing it in the past because the second best time to plant the tree is now. If you'd like to learn more, go to hravg.com, and I hope you join me for our next webinar on February 25th. We'll be talking about the Strategy Cube Method. It is a very quick time-to-market method in analyzing strategy. Strategically analyze any company from the one you are interviewing for to the one that you own in 20 minutes or less. Thank you all for joining me. I'm going to toss it back to you, JV. Thank you so much, Vincent, for the great presentation. Uh, go ahead, attendees, if you guys have any questions. Um, but we could go ahead. Uh, I think there's a few right here that we could start off with. Uh, one question is that uh, if I spend too much time on email, or I spend so much time on email, it's cutting time to the actual work I need to do. Do you have any suggestions? Sure. Just to reiterate, I think it's a mistake to start replying to your emails first thing in the morning because you're taking up your mental bandwidth and by the time you work on projects, actual work, um, you might already be a little bit mentally tired. So I think it's very important to, one, um, the night before, write down the tasks you want to work on the following morning work on those things, let's say from 9 to 10, 39 to 11, and then check email. When you check email first, you're letting other people set your own agenda. Second, I also think it's okay to use auto-reply. Let's say you're going to spend from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. simply working on a, on a project. You don't want to be on email. Put in a temporary auto-reply. I will not be on email from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m and I will answer the following day. Because it's about mitigating people's expectations. If they've already been notified that you're not going to reply until that evening or the next day, well, they understand, so you've already alerted them. That might be another um, tip as well. And feel free not to reply to every single email that does not require a direct reply. Remember, email is very efficient, but if we're emailing all the time to everyone, regardless of efficiency, it is now cutting into our production and not assisting it. Thanks, Vincent. Another question is that if I put the entire email in the subject line, would people think that's rude? Well, a great way to handle your personal branding is that when you meet people face to face or speak to them on the phone, tell them, say, hey, listen, um, I was at a webinar or I read something in, in, in a magazine uh, about putting the entire subject line uh, in an email. I think I'm going to start doing that because it really uh, takes the other person a lot less time to process the email. So I think it's a great thing to talk about when you meet people. Let them know why you're doing it and then you're going to begin to be known as the person that really respects other people's um, time. If you're worried about being seen as not polite, the first time you do it, you could send an email explaining why you're doing it. Because remember, the best way to learn something is to teach other people. So the way you position yourself as a thought leader, if you think putting the entire subject line, the entire email on the subject line is effective, let people know that you're doing and maybe you could lead the trend in your own organization where you tell people what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it's better for everyone, and then, of course, they're not going to think that you're being impolite. They're going to think that you're a thought leader and you're actually trying to initiate a trend for the positive in your organization. Okay. Thank you so much, Vincent. I think that's all the time that we have today. I just want to thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you do come up with any additional questions, feel free to send them to webinar at netcomlearning.com. Again, uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, Vincent. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.